Uh, I'll thank you. So obviously it's been recorded. So um, just so everyone's aware of that. Um, and, you know, it's a great pleasure to have another uh, paper in our Collecting the West seminar series. Um, for those of you, most of you would know, but we're, we're kind of using these as a means to pull together some book chapters for a volume that we want to do out of the project. And so it's forcing many of us to actually engage with some of the, the core ideas of the project. And it's wonderful to have Andrea, who is co-leading the project, um, Collecting the West, uh, talking about some of the things I know that she's been deeply interested in throughout the life of the project so far. Ideas of value, the ways in which we can really resituate these incredible exchanges that become apparent and, and think about them anew and really give them, I think, primacy in the ways in which we think about um, collections. So um, I'll hand over to Andrew. If you have any questions along the way, of course, um, put them in the chat or we can have them afterwards. It's, it's a fairly informal um, session. I'll invite you, of course, to keep your microphones on mute if they're not already on mute. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the end of Andrea's presentation. I'll hand over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Al. And of course, I want to acknowledge that I'm on Indigenous country that has never been ceded. And um, in my own case, I'm on Wurundjeri country in Fitzroy in Melbourne. And I wish to thank, to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. All right, here we go. This is very much, um, despite what Al said, I am actually only just beginning to think through what I might do with these histories of, of exchange. So here we go. And it's very much an invitation to all of you to help me think it and um, yeah, come up with, with possible resources that I might be able to use to improve this. Okay. So in an article analysing the role of regional museums in South Australia, in shifting historical consciousness towards a recognition of colonial encounters, Amanda Nettlebank suggests that progressive histories are due to the emergence of national histories over imperial histories and the concomitant need for nations to deal with challenges from human rights perspectives. The rise of national histories have, she argues, demanded a recognition of interconnecting and sometimes competing perspectives making it impossible to maintain a straightforward narrative of national progress. While critical national histories have certainly encouraged a more pluralist curatorial practice and one which has space for different voices, not all of which chime in concert, I would also agree with her that such pluralist curatorial strategies do not go far enough in working through what we need to work through as a nation in coming to understand what happened on the frontier. Through the Collecting the West project, I have become interested in the potential of collecting histories to provide a mechanism for museums to engage with their own role in colonization, including what happened on the frontier, and to make that part of the histories they communicate to the general public. But to do so, I am beginning to think that attending to the histories of collecting and their legacies in the present also require us to return to imperial histories, or at least to attend to the imperial imagination. For what is clear is that in Western Australia, and no doubt in other parts of Australia, the history of collecting is deeply embedded in extractive processes of colonialism, and through that to transnational global histories in which collecting produces a form of what Nick Caldry, a media theorist, recently called data colonialism. While Caldry is wanting to define the basis of a new form of capitalism in the present, a form which is based on the acquisition of data through digital platforms, what people refer to as datafication, that he reckons are as expansive as historic colonialism's appropriation of land, resources, and bodies, I want to suggest that we can also understand the extensive extractive nature of collecting practices, practices at the turn of the 19th century as an attempt to produce data that underpin the social imaginary that sustained imperial economies. Data as a basis for economies is not, I suggest, a new phenomenon. 
if we understand economies in their broader sense, involving more than monetary value. I also want to suggest that such extractive practices and the uses to which they were put were only possible because of an imperial imagination. What follows is a rather sketchy attempt to think this through via analysis of the role of exchange in the ways the WA Museum built its collection in the late 19th and early 20th century and the practices that supported it. As I hope to show, underpinning these practices was a system of values as well as a method of valuing that was totally embedded in the extractivist approaches that underpin colonialism and which relied on the cultural imagination that was central to imperial ways of thinking. The argument is thus an extension of the work Alistair Patterson and I have already done, which was published earlier this year in Australian Studies, thanks to Jane Lydon. Thank you, Jane. But as I said, this is still very early in my thinking around this. No. The very first point to make is that from the very beginning, the first director of the WA Museum and Art Gallery, which opened in 1895, used existing colonial infrastructures to fill a program of rapid collecting. Bernard Woodward was wanting to collect vast amounts of natural history specimens, human remains and ethnographic material. His objective was not only to fill the galleries of the new museum, it was also to use this material to exchange with other museums around the world in order to build a collection and displays that would inform and delight his audiences in the wonders of the natural world, the richness of ancient civilizations, the customs and culture of the world's ethnic diversity and the heritage of the British Empire itself. Such worldly ambition is of course an extension of imperial imaginations as well as imperial networks. To build this collection, Woodward relied on various arms of the colonial establishment to do collecting work. Chief among them was his reliance on the commissioner of police who had at his command an entire army of men spread throughout the colony, including its remote outposts. Letter after letter to the commissioner asks him to request his men to collect in the field. In the earliest example of such letters in the letter books held at the museum, which I show here, he had this to say, and I warn you that the language would be, is offensive to our ears today. I have the honor to refer to your letter of the 28th of the 8th 93, meaning 1893, informing me that the Cool Guardy police have been instructed to collect and afford any native weapons. I am directed by the museum committee to request you to kindly remind the officers in the outlying districts how important it is to acquire native relics before it is too late. The committee will defray all expenses. Human skulls are much wanted both this museum and the other colonies. It is clear from these letters that they were asked to collect not only ethnographic material and natural history specimens, but also human remains. Other key people included the military establishment at Rocknest Island, commissariats in various locations, government geologists and surveyors. In the letter to the Colonel at Rocknest Island, for example, also shown here, Woodward writes that I have the honour by order of the museum committee to ask to, to be so good as to find any of the following specimens, all of which are urgently wanted in the museum. Five skulls of natives giving tribe, age and sex. Wallabies, birds, snakes. In fact, any natural history object. All this, a word I can't make up, mammals, birds, etc., can be sent unskinned and will be prepared once here by the taxidermist. In other words, Woodward used every possible arm of government and the authority behind it to collect. Care was taken to explain what kinds of materials the museum was seeking, as well as how to pack and prepare the materials, such as putting snakes in glass jars in spirits. 
The sheer quantity of material thus amassed enabled Woodward to establish a continuous collection of duplicates of everything that was collected, which could then be exchanged for material the museum could not afford to buy. The final letter in this slide shows this at work. In this case, the letter is to Baldwin Spencer, director of the National Museum of Victoria. I have the honor to enclose B slash L, the cast of meteorite from Rogan, northwest of WA, which I trust will prove of interest for your museum. I will forward further particulars later on. I shall be glad to make exchanges of duplicate specimens if agreeable to you. And then as a footnote, if you have a printed catalogue of your collections, I should consider it a favour if you would send me a copy and also one of the art collections. Woodward was not alone in this practice, of course. He was in fact part of a vast network of museum directors who corresponded with one another in order to facilitate a range of exchanges that would enable them to build a representation of the world in miniature, its natural and human diversity over time and space in ways that supported the evolutionary thinking of the time. Such global ambition was only possible, I suggest, in the shadow of empire. For empires are, by definition, forces that exert both centrifugal and centripetal movement. They are in the process of continual expansion while also taking in the other. Moreover, that other is needed in order to define the self, usually in a hierarchical visual relationship. And here I have, thanks to Al and Toby, um, also on part of the collect Collecting the West team, the beginnings of a visualization, we haven't yet put all of our data into our node goat system, but this just gives you an idea and visualizes that kind of worldly ambition of the movement of material from Western Australia and the Northern Territory to the rest of the world. There's a lot more objects to put in here. And what I would eventually like to also do is to um, use the museum registers to also put all the objects that came back in the, these exchanges processes. And you would literally see a um, very complex web of movement of objects across the world. Okay, I'll actually stop that. Okay, it is also, of course, the case that the very practice, oh, there's one other point I wanted to make. And that is that if, when I do get to that point of being able to visualize material coming back, the material that comes back isn't only coming from the um, centers of empire. So for example, with the Natural History Museum in Paris, what arrived in Perth were not natural specimens, but ethnographic material from the French colonies in North Africa. So this is kind of what I mean by this vast imperial imagination and network at work. It also is the case that the very practice of exchange was supported through social networks and communication processes that were themselves the legacies of empire. Woodward himself is an example of how this worked. He emigrated to Western Australia from England in 1889 and served as the curator of the Geological Museum, later Perth Museum, before becoming director. He came from a well-respected family, and there you have his family tree, of geologists who were closely associated with the British Museum and the Geological Society of London, giving him entry into the world of 19th century museums, a world that was shaped by imperial trading networks. International, the history of international exhibitions is but one example of how this worked. 
and there you have um, a list of material that Woodward sent to the very um, Glass International Exhibition in Glasgow, in Glasgow I showed you here. So Woodward used these connections well, as they offered him a social visiting card, so to speak, helping him to have the authority in the centres of empire. Thus, for example, in his first approach to the director of the Prague Museum in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, Woodward reminded Professor Fritz that he had met him in his father's house in London in 1880. Woodward's father, Samuel Pickwood Woodward, was professor of geology in the Royal Agricultural College and an assistant in the geology department of, department of the British Museum, while his uncle, Henry Woodward, became the keeper of that department. His other uncle was the keeper of prints and drawings at Windsor Castle. He was, in other words, close to the centre of the British Museum world and its connections to other significant museums at the time. He had, to use Bourdieu's term, social capital. Such connections also proved useful in finding financial resources to help him collect in the field, helping him to produce a valuable commodity to exchange. The museum's first curator, for example, John Tunney, was appointed as museum collector in 1895, with his salary partly funded by Lord Walter Rothschild, whom you see there on top of a turtle, who was building his own museum in Trigg in the southwest of England. Tunney was briefed with filling the gaps in the collections of WA's natural history and to get everything that you can. Over the next 13 years, Tunney conducted nine expeditions amassing material for the WA Museum and also for Lord Rothschild's private museum in England, Western Australian flora, fauna and ethnographic material. Both Woodward and Rothschild would instruct him to get particular items, whether of specific animals, ethnographic materials, or human remains, particularly skulls. While these were all highly sought after by museums in America, Britain, and continental Europe, where they would be used to represent diversity within the Darwinian evolutionary frames of the time, Tunney was far more successful with fauna than he was with either human remains or weapons. Nevertheless, with the help from the state's police force, as well as its, as its own field collector in the person of Tunney, who also used the networks with police, local magistrates and settlers, as well as, in, as Indigenous intermediaries, Woodward could amass hundreds of duplicate natural history specimens, as well as Aboriginal material culture, which he could exchange for natural history and ethnographic material from other parts of the world, as well as European artefacts. Woodward would then simply write to museum directors around the world, always with a copy of the guidebook to the museum he had written, sometimes with a specimen as a starting point for a dialogue. He would invariably ask for a copy of their guide to get an idea of what they had. This would then start a correspondence where each partner would indicate what they were after from each other's collections or parts of the world. Woodward wrote to museums in almost every continent, offering to engage in an exchange of collections. A range of vocabulary is used in these letters. Woodward wants to know what duplicates they have and are willing to exchange. He wants to know what their desiderata or their wish list might be, literally, what they want. He is always circumspect, asking for what might be spare and easily obtainable. A number of these ideas underpin, a number of ideas underpin these exchanges. As Al and I argue in our joint paper, Nature's Marvels, published earlier this year in the Journal of Australian Studies, these ideas relied on a range of, a range of practices that produced a particular kind of value which turned objects into commodities worthy of exchange. These ideas, in, these include ideas that we now take for granted, such as rarity, representativeness, uniqueness. These ideas are not given, we argue, but culturally produced, embedded in practice. The guidebook was one way of producing the underlying narratives that supported these values but the letters themselves also help to produce the value of particular commodities. 
For example, Woodward would send duplicates of unclassified fauna to be classified in places such as the Smithsonian, who then kept duplicates but sent back the type specimen. Conversation would occur as to whether or not a particular specimen was an example of a new species or not. Western Australian specimens of new species, species were highly coveted. The process of classification central to natural history was described in the 1900 Visitor's Guide to the WA Museum and Art Gallery thus. Classification is only a means to an end, and that end is to obtain a full knowledge and structure of development and habits of the animal or plant under consideration, a knowledge of the utmost value when, requ when acquired, while the search for it is most interesting and absorbing. Woodward worked hard to ensure his collection was at the centre of such activity and it was utilised by the most significant centres of knowledge production about the natural world at the, same, at the time. The same was the case for ethnographic material. The Smithsonian Museum's Assistant Secretary, for example, wrote in 1908 that the United States National Museum is in desirous of increasing its anthropological collections from Australia. The museum has learned that your museum has opportunities for collecting in your country, and it may be that special facilities exist for securing both skeletal and ethnological collections representing the Australians, with a view to exchanging it for specimens illustrating the customs and industries of North American Indians. The eventual trade included the skeleton of an Aboriginal person in exchange for a skull of a Sea Orcs person, with pottery and stone implements, basketry and beadwork. It also explored the exchange of birds and, ma animal and mammals from Tasmania and West Australia in exchange for North American mammals. So it appears that these institutions had a shared understanding of the value of the items in these exchanges the common economy, as suggested by the Smithsonian. If material of the kinds herein enumerated is desirable, a full equivalent can be furnished for the specimens which your museum will forward. The curator at the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, USA, for example, wrote in the margin of a letter listing items to be sent to Perth, I think this lot is pretty good exchange for the things you sent. For institutions then, the policy of collecting multiple duplicate specimens was a form of wealth creation beyond monetary currency. For any item perceived to be unique to a place, be it a spear, seabird, beetle, or indeed human skeleton, gained value through its specificity. Conversely, once a museum had one example of an item, then a duplicate need not be kept. In the example shown here, one can see the kind of balancing act that was practiced. And here you have a number of such exchanges, which we are slowly mapping. One of the museums that Woodward regularly exchanged with was the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, which already held an extensive collection of WO material due to the efforts of Fletcher Moore in the 1830s. With the help of Sir Winthrop Hackett, an arrangement was made to exchange various ethnological and natural history specimens for a copy of the famous early Christian cross at Monaster Boyce in County Heath. Unfortunately, the cross was destroyed in 1929 when extensive rain caused the collapse of the shelter in which the cross was then housed from the elements in the whale yard, as it was too large to be displayed in one of the galleries. Woodward, though, in his correspondence to Dublin, stressed the rarity of native fauna faced with extinction due to European colonisation, writing that he was sending to Dor Island for the Largoshefts and Largostrophets, etc., and that the two are almost extinct, but that small island 400 miles away is their last resort. This particular exchange also alerts us that Woodward wasn't only interested in ethnographic and natural his history specimens for his museum. 
He also wanted to amass a collection of decorative arts and archaeological material that he could use to educate Western Australians into both British civilization and the cultures and traditions of ancient civilizations and Europe more broadly. So that much is reflected in this table, which documents 27 exchanges that took place between 1900 and 1914. World War I and the collapse of imperial networks that followed it effectively put an end to these exchanges. What I would like to do now is to focus on one particular series of exchanges. Over a period of eight years, from 1901 to 1909, Woodward corresponded with and exchanged hundreds of natural history specimens, ethnographic material, and occasionally of ancestral remains from Aboriginal people, with Professor Enrico Giglioli in Florence. In return, Giglioli would send archaeological material of Roman and Etruscan origins. Enrico Hilia Giglioli, born in 1845, died in 1909, was a zoologist and anthropologist who is remembered as a founding figure of Italian science. As Jane Leiden puts it, he was an early scientific observer and an avid institutional collector. He was born in London to an English mother and an Italian father in 1845. His father was himself a medical doctor and anthropologist, later holding the chair of anthropology at the University of Padua. Giglioli attended the Technical Institute there, followed by a period at the London School of Mines from 1861 to 1863, during which time he met leading Darwin's Darwinian scientists such as Charles Darwin himself, Charles Lyell, Richard Owen, and Thomas Huxley, effectively becoming part of the British intellectual establishment. He then went back to Italy and graduated with a degree in natural science at the University of Pisa. His first academic post was the Technical Institute in Turin, where he classified and catalogued his extensive collection from a round the world trip which included the colony of Victoria in Australia, which he visited in 86, 1867, pointing to his London networks as enabling him to connect with people here, such as Bolden Spencer. In 1869, he took up the professorship in comparative vertebrate zoology and anatomy at the Royal Institute of Superior Studies in Florence, establishing the central collection of vertebrates, which carries his name to this day. In 1877, he became director of that institution's vertebrate zoological museum. After his death, his personal ethnographic collection went to the Pigorini National Museum of Prehistory and Ethnography in Rome. Pigorini was a close friend and his source of material for Roman and Etruscan items with which to exchange with museums such as the Western Australian Museum and the Canterbury Museum in New Zealand in the 1870s. During his visit to Victoria in 1867, Giglioli traveled to the Murray River area in search of authentic Aborigines, as well as to Corenberg. As well as collecting ethnographic objects, Giglioli also took, as well as collected, photographs of Aboriginal people, subsequently writing two books about them. According to Jane Lydon, his use of photographs was innovative at the time and directed at evidencing his argument that mainland Aboriginal people were homogeneous, belonging only to one race. His work demonstrates both the impact of the theory of natural selection outside Britain and the global importance of Australian data, particularly imagery, in establishing the evolutionist, evolutionist schema. The importance of visualization in displays of the time explains why he, along with many others, also considered skulls particularly noteworthy. Giglioli, for example, exchanged zoological specimens with the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in return for a very rare Munduruku trophy head, which, along with Maori heads, were prized possessions in Europe at the time. Aboriginal skulls were likewise sought. His exchanges with the museum in Rio de Janeiro in 1889 included one female Pteropus polyocephalus, gray-headed flying fox from Sydney, 
Australia. No doubt the result of an exchange with the Australian Museum. And one Hydrosaurus varius, a lace monitor from Victoria, probably an exchange with um, the museum in Victoria. Giglioli was therefore at the center of a vast network of exchange through which vast quantities of material from the New World arrived, found its ways not only to European museums, but museums around the world. I think Woodward began to exchange with Giglioli in 1901, though it could be earlier. There are letters and lists whose dates are indiscernible. So far, I have counted 18 letters from Woodward to Giglioli and two from Giglioli to Woodward. These lists that, uh, so there's one of, um, one of his letters to, uh, from Woodward to Giglioli. These lists I am showing you here document the first shipment of material to Florence I can date to 1901. There are two other very large consignments. In this one, there are 23 ethnographic items from the northwest of WA and 75 specimens of which 36 were birds. In the registers of the museum, there is one entry for a Roman lamp in 1901, followed by 84 entries in 1902 for ceramic and pottery, mostly from Etruscan and Roman, with some later pieces from the Italian Renaissance period. I haven't yet looked in the registers from the science areas to see if there is any Giglioli material there, but I think that Woodward was only interested in Italian decorative arts and Roman and Etruscan material for the art gallery part of the museum, as this letter from Woodward to Giglioli makes clear. He does appear to have some interest in folkloric costume, but I have not seen such material recorded in the museum's early registers. Clearly, Woodward was interested in to exchange with Giglioli because the latter could help him bring the ancient world to Perth, as well as helping with the history of decorative arts. The two men, however, also shared scientific interests. Giglioli's interest in exchanging with Woodward was based on his knowledge that Woodward could access rare and unique specimens of natural history for his zoological museum helping him build his own representation of the world's history of fauna. Giglioli was wanting to build a comprehensive collection from all parts of the world. Woodward would send more than one example of each animal, for example, precisely for this purpose. You can see that there are um, duplicates in that list. So on the right-hand side, um, there are you know, do means um, repeat the same, the same animal being sent. Okay. All right. So they also had an interest in them um, in science, as, uh, as I was saying. So in this exchange of letters, Woodward is letting Giglioli know Oh, sorry, a bit behind here. So there, there you are. That's why I think he was only interested in, in the Etruscan and Roman material and some um, decorative arts. I don't think he ever got the folkloric kind of material. Yeah, here we go. So in this exchange of letters, Woodward is letting Giglioli know that some marsupials he had sent him had been reclassified by Mr. Oldfield Thomas so that he had the correct information for his catalogue. That's the typewritten letter on the left. Six years later, in 1907, Giglioli writes to Woodward to let him know he is working on bats and that he and his colleague in Genoa, with whom he was working, were both very badly provided with Australian species. And he would be very much obliged if Woodward would kindly send him any that you might have to spare from Australia, preserved in alcohol, merely with a label, with date and locality. Indeed, those from the same locality may be done up in small bag, if, and they can very well be sent per parcel post, stayed up, tied up in an ox bladder with cotton wool 
highly impregnated with alcohol so as to keep damp and packed in a wooden box. As I said, you will do me a great favour in sending me what you can spare, and if you have indeterminate species, we can name them for you and send back to you with names attached. But I would beg of you to send what you can spare soon, at once, if convenient to you. The ethnographic material either ended up in, Gigli in Giglioli's own personal collection, later donated to the Pignorini Museum in Rome, or was exchanged for other material from other museums across the world. Woodward did send him the bats, and here's a letter from Giglioli um, thanking him for it and saying that um, the Marcus of Genoa is still working on them and he'll let them know, he'll let him know um, once they've named them all. Okay. So while I still have some work to do to categorise all of this material, chase every bit of material that came to the WA Museum and try to fathom what Western Australian material might have been exchanged by Giglioli with other museums, it is very clear that these exchanges were supported by networks of learned men who were deeply embedded within imperial institutions and whose knowledge was the product of a history of collecting that itself relied on colonial and imperial infrastructures. In the case of WA, this included a vast network of policemen, as well as direct financial support from the British aristocracy in the person of Lord Rothschild. The vision that underpinned this practice of exchange was encyclopedic in scope thoroughly embedded in Darwinian ideas of evolution and utterly dependent on an extracted culture that viewed both the natural world and the social and cultural worlds of the colonized as raw materials that through the process of knowledge production could be turned into valuable commodities. Central to that was the information attached to those objects, their name, location, and the date. In other words, data. What then can we do with this knowledge? What are our own responsibilities? To return to Nettlebank's arguments at the start of this paper, can we use our knowledge of collecting histories and exchange practices to begin to provide a reflexive account of the role of museums in the process of colonialism, while also revealing complex stories of encounter on the colonial frontier. Within the Collecting the West project, we have started to experiment with how we might begin to do so. One of the new permanent galleries at the Boulevard Museum is the Treasures Gallery, set within Hackett Hall that you can see here. Hang on a minute, let me try and get rid of that. I realize it. Oh. Sorry, didn't realize that was happening. Okay, so here's the Treasures Gallery, which we helped to co-curate, set within Hackett Hall, once the Library of Western Australia and a repository of archives that were used to produce the colonial imagination in the writings of figures like James Batty. Not an auspicious start for such a conversation, perhaps. Nevertheless, we curated a row of three large display cases that you can see there within this gallery. So under the concept of treasures, which was given to us, we set out to tell a story about the history of collecting practices, key collectors and collecting institutions. The objects we selected were not treasures in the conventional sense of the word. Their monetary value is not very high, and they are not always particularly beautiful. They are, however, treasures because of the stories they can be made to tell. Stories of exploration, colonial encounters, curiosity, dispossession, loss. Stories of valuing one culture above another. Thus, to tell the story of Tunny, we chose a picture of him holding one of his prized collections with an Aboriginal woman in the background, hinting at the frontier context in, in which he undertook 
much of his work. Digital labels explain that much of what he collected was sent overseas for exchange with other museums, thus also signifying a loss of culture, both indigenous and natural, with many of the animals collected now extinct or on the verge, on the verge of extinction. In the next cabinet, come on. One, one, two. In the next cabinet, we have some of Giglio, Gillies, Etruscan and Roman material. Some of them little more than pottery shirts. Above them, a wooden bowl carved by Aboriginal people and one of the few objects left in the museum collected by the commissioner of police in circumstances unknown. It is a treasure because it points to all the objects now lost, in part to gain those Etruscan and Roman pottery examples. Using photographs, objects and archival documents, we work the space between the physical display and the accompanying digital interpretation layer to make these objects stand not for their place in art history, the history of ancient civilizations or anthropological knowledge, but for the relations between museums, colonialism, and the histories of collecting, and the kinds of knowledge such relations produced about the world and our place in it. We hope that opening up such a space might make a contribution towards a more reflexive account of the impact of the colonial experience on both sides of the frontier. And I have come to the end. Thanks for that, Andrea. All right. I enjoy that immensely. Um, so I will open it up. I haven't even checked to see if there's any chats. There's just been kind of like Tiff and I chatting about chocolate and having that pop up halfway through your talk, which was a light moment. <laughs> Not boring, hey? <laughs> oh, you need the chocolate. Okay, so we might get you to stop sharing your screen unless we need it. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. That's right. And then we can, people can, um, we've got a nice small group. So maybe if people have any comments or questions, you ask for a kind of feedback. So for this. I did, I need, I need help with teasing out the imperial imagination idea. I know I'm not there yet. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Alex. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for that, Andrew. It's fabulous. And thank you, Alex. So rich. Um, I'm really struck by the relationship with the police and then his relationship with Baldwin Spencer because Baldwin Spencer sets up a similar thing in I think about 1901, 1902 with the Victoria Police. Um, and I'm wondering whether, um, sorry, my dog's running around. Yeah. Like, um, but I'm wondering, you know, where did this idea come from? Um, and yeah, just that kind of police nexus. It's interesting that it's being adopted by multiple collecting institutions. I really think, you know, these museums don't have a lot of staff. And I really think they use the might of colonial administration. You know, um, the British Empire is kind of famous, really, for the way in which it uses um, yeah, for developing administration and um, as a form of uh, control. And I think, I think the police were just part of that. You know, it's there with Rottnest Island, with the military. And it's the, the police are the, are the people who are patrolling the frontier, literally. Uh, and, but I do, but it is interesting that Spencer is doing it in Victoria because I think, you know, I have a theory that in WA this kind of practice is happening, is happening where the frontier is at any one space in time, whereas I think in Victoria the frontier is long gone 
you know, and so by the time Spencer is using police to collect in Victoria, this is thoroughly colonised country, and they're working from small towns, whereas raves as well. Yeah, whereas I think right. WA, uh, South Australia, Queensland are kind of different scenarios, and uh, you know, it, can I interrupt then? The police don't just stop when the frontier stops. I mean, the police continue to have relationships ongoing in intimate ways um, beyond that kind of um, really violent remote frontier situation. I think that's they're, they're another, you know, they're often are the ones giving out rations and having those kinds of encounters in different ways. Yeah. So, yeah. On the mission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind of part of, it really is, I mean, it, the police are, are one of the nexus where you really find the histories of our museums and the histories of collecting practices right at, well, in the midst of the, of colon, the colonial post, colonization process. We've got a question from um, Jane Lydon, which may build on that or not. Thank you, Jane. Her Darwin's. Uh, yeah, so, oh, yes. Hang on a second. I'm just. <laughs> it's all right. I, I need your help with the with the imperial stuff. It's the talking chair. <laughs> Where'd she go? She's gone. Um. Where'd she go? Ross, you've got something. You can be Jane. I'll just jump in very quickly before while Jane gets organised. Um, just in the context of the police collecting in WA, um, the. Phillips collection, which was the first collection yeah. in our ethnographic register, actually was presented to us in 1892. Um, and it actually probably built on the work that the police were doing for John Forrest. So the Forrest collection, I think, also was um, built largely by the work of the police. Yeah. Um, and there's a letter, I think, in one of the state records that instructs um, from Phillips to his officers in the field to start collecting. I think probably on the basis that John Forrest is trying to build something for Museum Victoria. Mm. Then, um, yeah. See, the remnants of that collection then becomes the first ethnographic collection here. So yeah. um, it's probably a little bit before 1895, but I'm um, obviously. Continues. But it, then it continues exactly. I think that's absolutely right. So that Phillips ball is, is a relic from that first ethnographic collection that was, yes, you're, you're absolutely right, Ross, of course. Um, but then, you know, in the very first book of letters, there, there's Woodward writing the police to continue exact the same commissioner, in fact, to continue exactly the same. And the police is also used to build collections for the international exhibitions. I mean, it says something about the internal logic as well of um, the colonial world that, you know, there's very few people, I've never seen anyone say that this was unusual for, for this kind of collecting to occur by the police, but yet it would seem very unusual now, right? So for us to go to instruct the police department to collect on behalf of the museum. So it's kind of, it's a real yeah. reminder of, of the distance in many ways between, uh, you know, the internal logic of the colonial world and today. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, there is one reference, I think, I don't know where it is, but of one policeman who actually balked at the idea of ah. part of his work. So for the- Oh, last, wow. I'd love to have that. that. Yeah, so I've got to try and track it down. It's, I think in the state records in one of our early, um, early archives. Oh, Ross, that would be fantastic to have. Because it's just so confronting what just the, the matter of fact way in which they just put five skulls next to, you know, wallabies, snakes. It's, yeah. Uh, any other questions? I think we've lost Jane sending me texts, but um, she's. Right. So I, I've asked her what the question was. Maybe she'll. <laughs> um, anyway. I think Linda has a uh, yes. hand up. Linda, you need to unmute. Yeah, sorry, I I lost the lost the cursor. <laughs> I know it's terrible when I was having problems with yeah, cursors too. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, just thinking about. Uh, collecting going on by government apparatus, uh, colonial civil services. Of course, it was highly developed in India yeah. where, where there are the, the colonial efforts like the geological survey and the uh, yeah. 
uh, what was the ethnographic survey? I, I don't think yeah, no, you're right. And there was an yeah. archaeological survey as well. Uh, so there you go. The There's my imperial. Survey. That's, that's right. Another, that's right. The yeah. imperial. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yes. it's that kind of context I'm thinking about. Now, you, we, we can see how those, those agencies make in uh, make connections with the the uh, the imperial center mm. uh, but uh, I, I wonder whether you've got any cases of where where there are exotic collections small quantities probably in rather small museums that have been donated from the families of some kind of collector were those collectors themselves civil servants of, yes. of some um, and I think, uh, uh, yes, because there is in the um, early register, ethnographic registers of the museum, the Western Australian Museum, there are key names of key colonial families uh -huh. who come via the empire. And so some of the earliest, say, Indian material is through such families. Yeah, Princep is one. So that's, that's the one, yeah. Princep. Yep. Yep. Oh, Spot Princep. on, Linda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 In fact, it may even be a source of, of uh, Indigenous material that might, might have got back to the museum over a couple of generations. That's true as well. Mm. Yeah. Ross might have examples there, but I'm pretty sure that's true, that there would be ethnographic material donated by settlers at the forefront of yes. push at the frontier. Or, or their heirs who had lost interest in that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah no, we continue to get that sort of thing. We had a, a donation recently from a woman whose father worked in the Pilbara in the 1940s. Um, and obviously his work there, by then, obviously, there was a bit more of a souvenir trade or a tourist trade. So I guess that that exchange probably is slightly different to earlier examples, but, um, but I think it still represents that, that form of government involvement in, in a collection process. Mm. Mm. Okay. Question? Oh, sorry, Deb, you go first. Here you go. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering, Andrea, like you're talking about the, the police being involved with the collecting. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you come, because you mentioned Corin Dirk. I yeah. was wondering if you'd come across anything with missionaries collecting, because um, there was at the um, art gallery in Warnable, they've got materials from WA there. Um, and they also mentioned being um, items coming through from Corin Dirk. So I was wondering if there was a thread that could be pulled on. From that. So that so Jacqueline's talk last week talked about um, one particular lot of missionary collectors, but yeah, um, yeah, that there, there are quite a few, but I actually don't know if they end up in the collection of the WA Museum so much. Yeah, I mean, there's New North here, which has its own collection, and that, that's connected, as Jacqueline explained last week, to the kind of Catholic. Um, missionary network. So, you know, their collections that the material that they collected ends up in the Vatican, for example, or in Spain. But I, I'm not, is there much material from missionaries in the WA Museum? Um, probably a more written on Father Nicholas, who's probably yep. the biggest contributor. That's it, yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a small essay on the Collecting the West website plug. Um, as well from Min, there's just yeah. from Min, I've forgotten about Father Nicholas. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, there is a bit there. Um, we are probably coming wow. to our end of our hour. I'm just gonna. I know it's um. Here we go. I'm gonna share this to plug. Um, get ready to plug for next week. You should be able to see that, and also to thank Andrew again for a very stimulating paper that kind of really. It was at the core of many of the things the project is interested in um, and raises prospects for follow on projects as many of these talks do. So, um, look, thanks again, yes, Andrea. Really appreciate your talk. And um, it's good work to everybody in the Eastern states. You're 
Uh, it's eight o'clock at night, so you're all you've done well. And um, look, next week we have a wonderful um, opportunity to hear from Rachel Hand, um, from uh, who's the collections manager at um, the Museum of Anthropology or well, the Museum of Arcanet, sorry, at Cambridge. And she's been really interested in the project and supportive and helped us through. Uh, and she's particularly interested in um, what's happening in all things Dublin. And um, she's actually been there this week. She's not here tonight because I think she's actually en route back from Dublin to Cambridge today. So she'll watch it um, when we put it on YouTube, which all of these talks uh, end up on the Archaeology at UWA website's YouTube as well. So you can return to them there. So do join us next week. Uh, and um, we look forward to seeing you then. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending tonight.